Hello. Thank you for joining me at my Sleepy Time Reading Channel, where we do soft-spoken readings of mildly interesting public domain works that give you something to listen to to distract your mind from being anxious or worrying about anything and helps you drift off to sleep. I like to call it interesting, but not too interesting. Today I am returning to a book from the early 20th century called How It Is Made, in which the author follows the manufacturing process of various common items at the time. We've previously done matches, pianos, and the like, and today we are moving on to a chapter about candles and soap. So this is How It Is Made, Candles and Soap. The importance of the candle, early candles, sperm and tallow, chevrol's discovery, styrene, olein, and glycerine, paraffin wax, testing a candle, the preparation of styrene, refining paraffin scale, the wick, candle molding, the machine used, self-fitting ends, night lights, soap, its manufacture. The game is not worth the candle is a saying that dates from a time when a candle was much more costly, more troublesome to make, and less efficient than it is today, and yet of much more importance as an illuminant, because oil and gas and electric lighting were still things of the future. In spite of the introduction and universal use of these last three, the candle still holds its own, partly because it has certain conveniences, and partly because improvements in manufacture have at once reduced its cost and increased its light-giving power. The earliest candles were mere dips made by immersing a wick in a tank of liquid tallow or other fat. Presently, spermaceti, a wax found in considerable quantities in the skull of the sperm whale, was introduced. Sperm candles are beautifully white and burn with a regular flame, on which account they have long been and still are used as the standard measure of artificial light the standard candle being so prepared as to consume 120 grains of sperm per hour. But both sperm and tallow candles had their disadvantages. The first were costly, the second guttered or melted so fast that a large part of the fat ran down the side and was wasted. It remained to find a substance at once cheap and slow melting. Chevrol, a French chemist, issued a book in 1823 to prove that fats were not simple substances as had been previously supposed, but compounded of a mixture of solid fatty acids, now called styrene, a liquid fatty acid, olein, and glycerin. This discovery showed why tallow was so unsuitable for candle manufacture. The softer materials melted first, and overflowing the cup formed by the harder caused the wasteful guttering referred to. Furthermore, glycerin, though valuable for many purposes, was of no use as an illuminant. By 1832, it was possible to separate styrene, the most useful of the elements, from tallow on a commercial scale. Four years later, patents were taken out for extracting the oil from coconuts, and in 1842, further discoveries had placed many kinds of greases, less expensive than tallow, at the disposal of the manufacturer. From that time onwards, the whaling industry, which had grown and flourished on the demand for spermaceti, gradually declined as styrene grew in favor. Another important date in the history of candle making is 1850, for in that year, paraffin wax, a white, transparent, solid substance produced during the distillation of petroleum, first made its appearance as a candle material. The production of this useful wax was comparatively small till the opening up of the great oil fields of America but has since increased to some 120,000 tons per annum. Paraffin wax did not oust styrene, however, and for this reason, it is a substance which, under the influence of heat, becomes plastic before it reaches its melting point. Styrene does not. If you took a candle made of each substance and placed them, supported only at the ends, in a hot room, the styrene candle would remain straight, but the other would sag at the middle. Fortunately, this weakness can be overcome to a considerable extent by mixing paraffin wax with styrene, and the first and not least important part of the candlemaker's work consists in so blending the two substances that the desired rigidity and a warm atmosphere may be attained without sacrificing the transparency that is one of the chief attractions of paraffin wax. To conclude these preliminary observations, one, 
The two materials now most commonly employed in candle making are stearine and paraffin. 2. Stearine candles are best suited for a hot, stero-paraffin for a moderately warm, and paraffin for a cold atmosphere. 3. Candles made from beeswax or spermaceti are too expensive to be generally used. We may now consider the preparation of stearine and paraffin. Stearine. It has already been remarked that, generally speaking, the three most important elements of animal and vegetable fats are 1. Solid fatty acids, stearic and palmitic, stearic and palmitic, commercially known as stearine. 2. Liquid fatty acid, oline. 3. A non-acid liquid, glycerin. Of these, the first is the most useful to the candle maker. The second and third are valuable byproducts. A large part of the plant, machinery, of the factory is devoted to separating stearine from oline and glycerin. The fats, whether vegetable or animal, undergo the following treatments. A. They are melted from the casks in which they arrive and clarified by boiling to remove all fibrous matter. B. Decomposition. The purified fat is then transferred to a stout copper vessel called an autoclave or digester, and after some water and a little lime have been added, is subjected for several hours to a steam pressure of 120 pounds to the square inch. The lime and water effect the separation of the fat into fatty acids and glycerin. When the decomposition is complete, the mixture is run from the autoclave into a tank, the glycerin is drawn off, and the lime is removed by means of weak sulfuric acid. C. Acidification. The fatty acids are next treated with strong sulfuric acid, which improves the color, destroys undesirable substances, and converts some of the oline into the more valuable stearine. Distillation. To purify the acid yet further, they are run into large stills and heated by steam until they vaporize. The vapor and steam pass through a series of upright condensers, from which the purified acids emerge as an almost colorless liquid and flow into large tanks. From these, they are run into shallow tins and allowed to cool gradually into solid cakes. E. Pressing. The cakes contain both stearine and oline and are fit for conversion into composite candles, but it is more desirable to separate the stearine and use that only for candles. The cakes are therefore placed in flat canvas bags and squeezed twice in hydraulic presses, separated from one another on the first occasion by cold and on the second by steam-heated plates. The oline oozes through the canvas and is caught, but the more solid stearine cannot get through. The stearine emptied out of the bags is almost snow white and ready for the candle making process. We may so leave it for a time and consider the other important substance, paraffin wax. This arrives at the factory in barrels or bags and is of a more or less pronounced yellow color. Before it can be used for candle making, it must have the coloring matter removed and be rid of the softer paraffins and all oil. The first stage in the refining is to remove the scale, as it is called, from the barrels and tip it into large underground tanks of several tons capacity where it is melted by steam. It is pumped from these tanks into settling reservoirs, and the water having been drawn off is run into trays to cool. The trays are then placed in heated chambers and subjected to a carefully regulated temperature, just high enough to cause the softer paraffin to melt and flow away with any oil present but not sufficient to affect the harder wax. The latter, after this process, is much whiter than the crude paraffin scale, but needs further purification. This is effected by melting the wax in large agitators and mixing with it some charcoal or other color-removing carbon. The carbon is then allowed to settle, and the paraffin is blown by steam through pipes to the mixing room in another part of the factory, where it meets the stearine. A very important part of the candle is the wick. In the old-fashioned candle, the wick consisted of fine threads of cotton lightly twisted together. During combustion, the carbonized end remained nearly erect in the flame, interfering with the combustion, unless removed frequently by the snuffers, which formed part of the candlestick equipment. In 1825, a Frenchman named Cambessers discovered that if the threads were braided instead of being twisted, the, the wick would bend over and its end be burned off by projecting through the side of the flame. This was a very important discovery, and one that has practically saved the candle industry, yet something more than braiding is required for the perfect wick. 
a means had to be found of removing the small quantity of ash or mineral matter present in the cotton, which if allowed to remain would clog the wick. This is attained by soaking the wick in a chemical preparation, usually made by dissolving borax and sulfate of ammonia in pure water. Wick thus treated and then thoroughly dried burns correctly, the ash being converted into glass during combustion, and the minute glass particles dropping off from the bent wick so as to leave the end free for the melted fat to ascend to the point where combustion takes place. A wick is accurately proportioned to the amount of substance in the candle in order that it may suck up the melted wax at a regular and constant rate. If it were too large, too much liquid material would be carried to the flame at a given time, and there would be imperfect combustion, resulting in a smoky flame. On the other hand, if it were too small, it would fail to consume all the melted matter, which would run down the sides of the candle and cause the guttering that renders tallow dips so objectionable. It is an interesting sight to watch the wick plating machines at work. Each has a number of spindles revolving about one another and interlacing a series of threads. As fast as it is made, the wick is wound off onto reels. We now come to the final stage, that of candle making. Two methods are now commonly employed, one, dipping, two, molding. Dipping. A dipping machine consists of a long trough containing the melted fatty acids, and above it an iron frame suspended by chains passing over pulleys and counterbalanced by weights. The wicks are wound upon the frame, immersed in the fatty melted material and allowed to remain there for a few seconds that they may be well saturated. The frame is then raised and placed upon a rack to permit the material to solidify. After several dippings in this way, the partially formed candles are released from the iron frame by cutting and transferred to wooden rods, and the alternate processes of dipping and cooling are continued until the dips have acquired a sufficient thickness which is indicated by the weights of the machine. Molding is the process by which most candles are now made. It is said to have been introduced in the 15th century. Passing over the improvements that have combined to bring the candle molding machine to its present state of perfection, we will give our special attention to the form now in general use. In the candle molding machine, there are pewter molds inserted into a watertight tank into which steam and cold water are alternately passed for the purpose of heating and cooling the molds. They are arranged in two double rows, averaging 24 molds to a row, or 96 molds to a machine. Some machines have more, some less, the number decreasing with the increase in the size of the candles made by the machine. A mold tapers slightly towards the bottom, which is closed by a piston shaped to produce the pointed tip of the candle. There is a hole in the bottom of the piston communicating with the piston rod, which is a hollow tube resting on a lifting plate, raised or lowered, by means of a rack and pinions. In the bottom of the machine is a series of pegs carrying reels of wick. The upper ends of the molds open into a trough above which is a rack of clamps. We will suppose that a workman has just raised the lifting plate and caused the pistons to push all the candles from the molds up into the clamps. As the candles move, they unwind the wick from the reels and draw it up through the hollow piston rods and molds. When the pistons have been lowered again, everything is ready for another pour. The workman first turns a tap, and steam rushes into the tank surrounding the molds, and heats them and the trough. When they are hot enough, he dips out a pailful of the melted paraffin material from a large copper and empties it into the trough and the molds below. After allowing time for the wax to settle down well, he turns off the steam and lets cold water flow through the tank until the candles are quite hard. Then he takes a knife and cuts off the wicks of the candles in the clamps, half an inch below the tips, discharges the clamps onto a table, clears the trough of material, and replaces the clamps above the molds. The lifting plate is raised, and the last batch of candles is pushed up into the clamps, and so it goes on all through the day. The process described applies to cylindrical candles. For candles with self-fitting or tapering ends, some modifications are needed. The mold is enlarged at its upper end to accommodate a cap, which forms a fluted conical butt, and when the candle is forced from the mold, the cap is carried with it. Before filling the molds with candle material, the wick needs to be threaded through the caps, which are then inserted into the top of the molds, the wicks being held over the centers of the molds by a slotted iron bar passing over the top of each row of molds. 
For ornamental purposes, spirally fluted candles are made. These revolve as they are pushed out of the molds. The company makes candles of all sizes, from tiny Christmas tree candles numbering about 80 to the pound, to the tall altar candle, five feet long, and scaling several pounds. Some of the larger candles are beautifully ornamented with transfer or hand-painted designs. The most commonly used candles run four, six, eight, or twelve to the pound. Night lights. These short, thick candles are very valuable for lighting nurseries and sick rooms. Their delicate construction demands more careful methods of manufacture than those required for the ordinary candle. Messrs. Price make two kinds of night lights, one in paper cases intended to be burnt in a saucer containing a little water to obviate risks of fire, two without cases to be burnt in small glass jars. The manufacture of the first being perhaps the more interesting, we will confine ourselves to a notice of it. The machines for molding are somewhat similar to those employed for ordinary candles, but the wick is inserted separately by hand. The cases are made as follows. Long strips, of thin, long strips of thin cardboard painted on one side are rolled round wooden cylinders and glued. After being dried and polished, they are handed over to girls who slip them onto a wooden lathe mandrel, and as they revolve, divide them into several rings, each of which is the cover of a nightlight. Other operatives stick in the bottoms, circular discs of cardboard, and to them affix the short wicks, which are passed through a piece of perforated tin to act as a support. The wax portion of the light, which has had a central hole formed in it by the molding machine, is slipped over the wick, and the light is then finished. From each batch, several lights are taken and burned in a glazed cupboard that their quality may be ascertained. I noticed with some interest that three lights, which had started together, had simultaneously reached their last gasp also together thereby proving the careful proportioning of the wicks. Soap. Soap is a compound of fatty acids, the alkalis soda and potash and water. The alkali may be said to be the essential cleansing element, but it cannot be conveniently used alone or free, lest it should injure the skin. So it is combined with fatty acids to form a solid substance which, when rubbed in water, gradually releases the alkali. The fatty acid is practically nothing more than a vehicle, playing the same part in soap that sugar, starch, etc. play in medicinal lozenges. For the manufacture of hard soaps, tallow and other animal fats, coconut and other vegetable oils, and resin are boiled with a solution of caustic soda in huge coppers of many tons capacity. The addition of some common salt causes the uncombined soda, water, and glycerin liberated from the fats to separate from the soap which is boiled again and finally run, while still warm, into large wooden or iron frames where it is left until cold. The sides of the frame are then removed, and the blocks of soap are cut into slabs, and then again into bars by special machines. Soft soaps are made from vegetable oils and a solution of potash, but are not salted, all the elements being allowed to remain. Toilet soaps are generally prepared from hard or yellow soap. Great care is taken that there shall be no free, or uncombined alkali present for the reason given above. The process of making the best soaps may be thus described. The molten soap, fresh from the copper, is stored in a large tank over the mixing apparatus. It is then passed between several powerful iron rollers, which partly cool and thoroughly knead it. A row of iron teeth pressing upon the bottom roller detaches the soap in the form of thin ribbons, which fall upon a band of very thin wire gauze and are carried by it through a heated, well-ventilated chamber, where they are deprived of most of their moisture. The coloring matter and perfume are then added, and the mass is well kneaded in another machine, which squeezes the strips together and presses the soap out through a nozzle as a continuous bar, which is divided by a knife into blocks of a certain length. Each block is placed in a press, the dies of which shape and stamp it with its own and the maker's name. After a few days' exposure to the atmosphere, the tablets are wrapped and are packed in cardboard boxes bearing artistically designed labels, or in wooden cases. I must not conclude, without acknowledging my indebtedness, to Mr. John MacArthur, the general technical manager of the company, who spent several hours in showing me the various processes, 
which convert paraffin wax, fats, and other substances into the articles mentioned at the head of this chapter. So that's how candles and soap are made. And my impression of modern manufacturing is that the processes remain fairly similar on both candles and soap. What they call toilet soap is, I believe, what we would consider bath soap or body bars. And the other soap is more intended um, at that time for laundry or dishwashing soap. So that's it for this episode of Sleepy Time Reading. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this, please click that like button. And if you want to hear more of my sleepy time reading, hit that subscribe button so you get the updates as they come out. I'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts, suggestions, recommendations. Please leave a comment. And I will be back soon with more sleepy time reading. Until then, bye-bye.